This is a unique podcast exploring the criminal justice system and those involved and affected. We'll educate and expose the public as well as potential jurors to what takes place behind the scenes of those who are facing the system. Your host owns a litigation support firm called Justice Technology Professionals, and he works on criminal and civil cases offering support to defendants and counsel. What you're about to hear is an open dialogue opening the minds to the public to what takes place in reality as opposed to what you think takes place ladies and gentlemen welcome to the justice tech pros podcast here's your host dominic crea hello listeners happy columbus day to all those listening and yes, I said Happy Columbus Day. I, I don't know where that falls now with this whole woke society, what's right, what's not. But to me, it's Columbus Day. So Happy Columbus Day. Um, a couple things I wanted to touch on today. Got a few random agenda items that I wanted to discuss. Uh, one of the things that um, stuck out to me, and I touched on this briefly in some past episodes, but... It stuck out significantly more so due to some current news items and the submission that went in for the defense team recently on uh, the case of Stephen Crea, Matthew Madonna, Christopher Londonio, and Terrence Caldwell. Uh, The Rule 33 Law of Memo submission. And just one thing I wanted to address, a lot of people are calling it an appeal it's not an appeal. It's separate. That's that's not the appeal. I explained that in, I believe it was uh, two episodes ago. I explained the difference. Uh, Rule 33 is an entirely separate filing. The appeal has not been filed yet. You have to wait and see what happens with the Rule 33. Also, um, what I wanted to touch on has to do with a lot of the comments I've been seeing on different sites, and uh, my staff's been sending me some material I like to keep track of just, it gives me a gauge of just the public and where their head's at and how they look at things. And it goes back to what I spoke about, how how it's so important for defense attorneys uh, to really vet the jurors. And it's a shame because they are limited in that. A lot of times they'll try to dismiss a juror and the judge won't allow it, but so what's disturbing about that is if you can't vet them properly, you really don't know who you're getting. And just pie in the sky idea, in an ideal world, what would be great is if you could vet the jurors and actually pull up, you ask them, you give them a questionnaire to ask if they participate on these different sites and forums, just so you could get a gauge of the type of comments they make or how they feel on issues, if they're open-minded or they're strictly one-sided On either side, it's just good to know because you you really want to get somebody who's going in there and serving jury from an unbiased place without having any predetermined discriminatory responses or thoughts. And you would get a great handle on that if you were able to really see the comments, see where they interact, see what kind of forums they're on, what kind of groups they're on. And the reason why this was prompted is because I noticed a lot of people a lot of comments that were made from many individuals, I guess they read about the Rule 33 submission, and this is across the board. It's not just um, uh, regulated to this one issue that I'm discussing, but that's what prompted it. And I'm sure it relates on so many different issues when they read news stories. You get a lot of people, they, they must have read the article of the Rule 33 submission, and a lot of people basically uh, don't really care about what the facts say. The comments, and I'm paraphrasing, but the comments followed the same theme, whereas they would just state, well, it doesn't matter. Even if they're not guilty of that, they should stay in jail anyway. They're right where they belong, things of that nature. And that just goes to show where they're coming from. And an individual like that, that's just how they are. Uh, But they have no business serving on a jury. And what's scary is I am would bet a lot of money that a lot of them do. And I'm sure when they're being questioned, 
by the prosecutor, by the defense attorney, and by the judge when they're trying to vet out who should serve on the case. You know they're not going to disclose how they truly feel. If they want to be part of the jury, most certainly on a high-profile case, jurors would take interest. They would want to be part of it. And you know they're going to keep all their responses lily-white to give them the best shot of serving on that panel. And it's truly scary because without knowing, you're bringing somebody on the panel who has all of these internal thoughts and beliefs. Although they're projecting to be unbiased and fair and they're promising the defense attorney, the promise, promising the prosecution, the judge, that they're going to look at the case and weigh the evidence. When they answer and they respond in a manner that I just laid out, they're not going to do that. They're going to pretty much waste their time, go through the motions, and at the end of the trial, vote a certain way simply based on their answers. If they're coming from a mindset without even looking at the facts of a case, that somebody is where they belong and they should stay, you have your answer right that. Now, obviously, it's a harmless nonsense comment in a forum or in a group, but I try to look at the bigger picture. To me, that tells what somebody's true personality is. When somebody's anonymous and they're making comments, that's usually their true persona because they don't normally have the courage to stand by their thoughts, so they have to make an anonymous account, anonymous name, and say things that they want to say and not really be held accountable to it because it's some random uh, fictional character that they created to say the things they want to say in these comments, these nasty uh, remarks, these moronic statements, to be honest, if somebody's innocent of the charges they were accused of, and you still want them to stay behind bars because you don't like what they may have been accused of in the past or what they may have served time for in the past, well, then you really shouldn't be serving on a jury. And I said that before, I would have much more respect for those type of people if they would say that when they were being questioned, if they were honest and they would just say, listen, I can't serve on this jury because I just cannot be um, fair. I can't give these defendants an equal opportunity to lay out their case because unfortunately I have this internal bias against them and I won't be able to weigh the facts as I am instructed to do so. And I just wanted to highlight that because it is important to give you a snapshot of society and how Although they call it a jury of your peers, it's really not. Like anything else, you're going to get people with personality, strong personality, strong beliefs. However, if they can't leave those at the door, you have to be able to separate. If you're going to take on the responsibility of serving on a jury and, in essence, be responsible for somebody's fate, you have to leave those things at the door. You owe that to the justice system. You owe that to... To, to yourself, you owe that to the public, but people aren't going to do that. Just by reading a lot of those comments, you could tell a lot of people aren't going to do that, and you'll see it all over. You'll see it on Reddit, you'll see it on these forums I talk about, uh, groups, YouTube videos. You could see where these people are coming from. If they just don't like somebody, they don't care about the facts, they don't care about if they're in jail wrongly based on the charges, they don't care about any of that. None of that means anything. They look at it like, well, if they're labeled a criminal, keep them in jail anyway. Okay, that's fine. Don't serve on a jury panel. And unfortunately, they do. It's pie in the sky for me to think that they won't. I, I know when they go and they answer all the questions, they're going to sit there and act as if they're going to give everybody a fair shot. But their true personality comes out when they make those comments, when they're able to make those comments and not be held accountable for them and not stand by them. And I just wanted to share that thought because it is something for people to think about. Although it seems like a throwaway comment, you brush it off as nonsense. You may, for those who are free thinkers and open minded and believe in the system, they'll just pass it off like, well, these people don't know what they're talking about. But the problem is, I agree with that, they don't. But the problem is, uh, that's a member of society who could one day eventually serve on somebody's jur uh, jury panel. And God forbid the defendants in front of them are classified in a category that they find the person is guilty no matter what. And that's a scary thought when you think about some that. It's such a, a minute point, but when you analyze it and try to compare it 
on what kind of impact it may have, it's disturbing to think about it. So I simply wanted to vet that out, talk about that a little, give the listeners something to think about when they are reading the comments. You get a feel for the type of people that are out there. And that leads me to segue into the other item, which is somewhat connected where it has to do with commenters. I notice a lot of people will look at commenters and they'll try to... um, I, I had a few emails where people would email my company and say, this commenter was on this channel and um, now they're commenting on your channel and you gave them a compliment and they favor informants. And I, I don't know, I think they're trying to like piece together a puzzle where I could be wrong, but I think they're trying to uh, insinuate by me, <laughs> by me interacting with the commenter uh, that there's some kind of relationship and I'm being hypocritical because the commenter may be friends with an informant. Listen, I have no idea. These are all strangers. They're random commenters. You do realize this is a worldwide audience. Anybody can access it. We don't do background checks on commenters. I don't know. I don't know anybody, honestly, personally, on this entire uh, platform. I've never met anybody in person. For me, when I decide who I'm going to hang out with, who I'm going to associate with, I don't use the test of social media to say, oh, this one's my friend, that one's not my friend. And it's not to be insulting. It's just I, I don't really have friends based on random people on social media or commenters. I wouldn't consider that my friend. A friend to me is somebody that I interact with. We hang out. I have their back. They have mine. We have the same belief system. That's what I consider friends. I, I think they're reaching a little where they try. I guess they don't like if you interact or you you try to be courteous. I, I come from a place where I, I'm always courteous to people. That's just how I was raised. Um, it reminds me of the old, uh, <laughs> that old uh, movie that's horrible, but you got to watch it. What was it called? Roadhouse. Be nice until it's time not to be nice. That That's my, my philosophy with Dalton, right? <laughs> For those who remember that movie. It's one of those horrible movies, like I said, but for some reason I say it's horrible, but every time it's on, I find myself watching it. <laughs> so you got to explain that one. You want to talk about being a hypocrite. That's a bit of a hypocrite, right? I- I'm abusing a movie and then I'm watching it. <laughs> so anyway, I-, I just find that odd. When I received a few emails and my uh, staff forwarded to me, I told them don't even respond. I-, I don't even know how to respond to something like that. Now it's a matter of, I guess, vetting every single person who comments seeing uh, seeing whatever their tie is to an informant. And I don't got the time for that, nor do I care. As I said, these aren't relationships. These aren't friendships. Uh, there's a few people that I feel if I did meet them in real life, we probably would be friends. And I say it time and again, I think uh, MRE and myself would have a lot in common if I knew who he was or we ever, uh, ever did have a conversation. I, I think we would have a lot in common. I could just tell by what he puts out there. And th- there's several like that. There's a lot of commenters, too, that I could tell we have a little bit more of an interaction. And I feel that there's somebody that if I did meet them, I, I would have a uh, pleasant relationship with them. And I would probably be uh, proud to call them my friend. But I can't do that until I meet somebody, interact. To me, it's just social media. It's random people. There's good, there's bad. I really can't call anybody my friend that I didn't meet. I don't have a relationship with. That's just how I am. I see a lot of podcasters where they'll say, this one's my friend. And then you find out they never even met him. It's all from comments. You don't really know who people are on there. A lot of people don't use their identity. A lot of people, and and that's fine too. They just want to go around, but you just don't know who they are is what I'm saying. At their core, you don't know their value system. system. You don't know where they come from. And it's really hard to say somebody's your friend when you don't know those things, at least for me, at least for me. So I wanted to just touch on that because I got a, I was sent a few emails on that and I was a little confused and I almost laughed that people are actually taking the time to worry about those things. Imagine taking the time out of your day to send an email about that, about commenters and trying to piece together why you're dealing with this commenter or why. And that even goes for a lot of uh, thanks I'll give. If somebody shares my show or shares the an audio book that was about the case and I thank them for it, 
That's called common courtesy, people. That's called thank you for bringing light to something. I don't know their background. I don't, I, I don't vet that. It's not important to me. I look at it very simplistically. You took the time out of your day to share something that brings light to a, an issue that I feel needs exposure, and it's appreciated. That's it. Now, don't get me wrong. When I know something blatantly, if I've seen, like, uh, say an informant says something positive or something, I won't even acknowledge that. I don't care. Don't say anything positive. Don't even bring up anything about, uh, you know, my name, my podcast. I don't want any promotion from that angle. So that'll never happen. So uh, do me a favor. Don't, don't even, I doubt they would anyway, because I'm pretty sure every informant wouldn't like me. But my point is, that will never get acknowledged because that's something I'm blatantly aware of. I know the character and I know that, so I wouldn't take any of those compliments. I wouldn't want any of that coming my way. And like I said, I probably wouldn't get it anyway. But I just want to make a clear point. When you're aware of certain things that you have a clear answer on, then it, then it comes to an internal judgment call on how you're going to handle it. And I notice a lot of these informants, that's what they'll do with other people. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, butter them up to try to get on their good side so then they talk good about them and build a relationship. For me, I look at it like damage control, especially now with all the YouTube channels popping up and some of them are against the uh, the concept of lying informants. So they'll try to reach out, extend an olive branch to kind of pull them on their side. They're playing the game, you know, to, to minimize the damage. Um. So I, I see that tactic take place a lot, and you know I have my opinion on that. To me, I, I think it's clear as day what's taking place. I don't think that's genuine. I think there's an angle there, but that's just me. The other thing that I noticed that somebody um, actually sent me, which uh, was nice of them. They, they made a, a very keen observation, and it had to do with Google Images. And what was interesting that was observed, this person had told me that when you Google a certain informant's name, what used to come up on the Google images no longer comes up. And what it was was a while back, I believe it was the Post. It was either the Post or the Daily News. I honestly don't remember. I think it was the Post, though. They did an article on one of, the, of, of an, about an informant and it was called like uh, Ghost in Ostra, something like that. It had to do with the informant who apparently saw spirits um, that dictated whether or not to cooperate. The, the spirits guided this informant, apparently. And it was on the front page. And maybe about two, three months ago, when you would Google the informant's name under images, the cover of that post article would pop up. And now it's really not available. I believe uh, just one source had it, and it wasn't the uh, original document, uh, the original newspaper. It was just something else about the story. Uh, I think it was Toronto Sun ran a story as well. But I found that interesting. That tells me, and I've heard you're able to do that, and obviously with the government, I'm sure it's very easy for them, but that tells me how they do get involved with the search results, and they'll pull certain things that may be that may cause a problem if, if let's say, an informant is going to be testifying on cases and, and jurors start to try to look people up. If they're actually changing the search results, which I'm sure they're doing, and they're pulling down images, that's very interesting, you know. And, and that has to do with... It has to do with a lot of my strategy with the defense end of it, whereas I do certain things to get positive results for defendants. Uh, you could purchase domains, you could do certain SEO keyword searches where you pump certain SEO words that you want to pop up and, and relate that to positive articles or positive write-ups or podcasts about defendants. So the defense team could also play that game. Unfortunately, they don't do that. I haven't seen any do that. Um, I, and I think it's an important tactic that they forget about that really should be focused on when you're defending a client. You really should allocate a percentage of the budget to focus on those things. Be Although they sound insignificant, it's really not. And I say it time and again, I know that jurors are instructed 
not to go on the internet, not to search things, but let's be realistic. Do you really think if somebody's serving on a jury panel, they don't ever go on their phone in between days when they're home at night, pull up their phone, put in some search words and see who they're, who they're basically deciding the fate of? You don't think that they do background checks on all the individuals involved? And when I say background checks, I just mean, I'm using that term loosely, I simply just mean doing searches on the internet, just to get a feel of who they're dealing with. I'll bet any amount of money that happens. That definitely happens. There is no way a jury is not going to do that. Curiosity alone is going to take over, and they're going to plug in some searches, and they're going to want to see what pops up. And that's why I personally feel that should be part of the total defense package when you're defending a client. And when I'm involved in cases, that's one of the things we do focus on because I feel it's important. Defense attorneys may agree with me, but now ask me if I care if they agree or not. <laughs> to me, I, I try to think of things that are in the best interest of the defendant and the best ways to get that defendant the fairest trial possible. And to me, that's an important piece of the puzzle. It may be a small piece, but it is an important piece of the puzzle. You want to do what you can to get the positive side out there. You want to do what you can to, to fight that media narrative that's going to come crashing down. Because if the government or the state is driving that narrative, they have a ton of resources and they're able to really capitalize on that. Now, if you just leave that alone, all you're going to get is whatever side of the story they want to put out there. If you oppose that, a little bit, and I'm I'm not saying you're going to make an impact like they do. Obviously, they have a bigger budget, uh, more serious connections. They probably have a ton of connections, and they're able to really get things. But the small part you could play, play it. If you could do it on Facebook, you could do it on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, podcast, however you could do it, play that small role because you want to counteract it a little. Just to try to get it in there, just to slip it in there so potential jurors or current jurors will get a little piece of the other side. It's better than nothing, folks. That's how I look at it. It's better than not doing it. I'm not saying it's going to be a, a major oppositional strategic system that you put in place, but I will say it's going to be putting something there that otherwise didn't exist. It's better to get a little bit of pushback on that level. So I, I think that's overlooked sometimes, but once I saw, and again, I thank the person for sending that to me, I thought that was a keen observation uh, and very astute to pick up on that. Um, I, I believe, to me, that tells me that they went through the trouble of removing those Google images. That tells me that they know it is important. The government's smart. We all know that. All the team of the government, they're smart people. So for them to go that route, they know it's important. They're basically seeing what I'm seeing. They're seeing the importance of that. So to take those steps, what does that tell you? Right? If they're doing that, if they're taking the time to do that, that tells you that they know it does play a role in how they can put things out in the media and have the public believe a certain way or have the public make up their minds prior to trial even beginning. So for them to do that, that means it's on their radar and they're taking the, the steps and the measures to try to get involved and shift things a little bit. So in the same token, the defense should try to do the same strategy on the opposite end of things. Try to put the positive out there. Try to put facts. If it's a case where facts are not dictating the charges, the defense could put facts out there. And that would be something that the defense team has to strategize on because certain things are protective order, which I speak about often. So you have to pick, be, be intelligent about it and pick things that would not jeopardize the defense team, but at the same time give a little uh, a view that is more positive for the defendant. So that's something, again, that the defense team, the defendant should bring up. If you're a defendant, maybe broach your, your defense team about that and see what could be done. And that's a lot of things that could be done on the family level and friends level. You don't even need the attorneys to get involved in that. I would suggest make them aware of it so they could guide you in what is acceptable and what's not. But you could have your family and friends put certain things on all these different outlets. 
use hashtags of maybe the defendant's name or whatever it may be that'll bring attention to it. Just something to offer that different outlook, the other side of the story. I always talk about how you need to get every side of the story. And just so you could make a more informed determination and conclusion. So it's something definitely for the defense to be aware of, families of the defendants to be aware of, whereas you could do something to help to help the um, story, to help the narrative, to help the background, to help the search results, whereas the defendants could have almost somebody fighting in their corner on that level, in that realm, where it's not all negative, not all negative. That's the point I just want to make and I think is important for people to be aware of. It's something to think about, for sure. Another item I wanted to kick around is the importance of really fact-checking and verifying your sources. I made a post on it on the YouTube channel under the community tab, whereas I came across a podcaster who did a story, and the story was actually about uh, my father's case, and wrongfully they said one of the defendants died a year ago. Now, they got that from one news story which was inaccurate. My point on that is just, I don't want to harp on it, but the bigger picture here is, for all the listeners, just make sure you're fact-checking. If you're really interested in a topic, fact-check it. Reach out to credible sources. Look for credible sources. Don't just pull one and run with it. Before you open up your mic and you talk to your listeners, make sure your facts are in order. Because when you make certain statements that are inaccurate, it does have an impact on family members. Think about that. What family members want to hear that somebody in their family died a year ago when it's not true, when they're already dealing with a lot of hardship? To me, it's irresponsible and it's lazy because it takes probably five minutes with that specific fact just to go on websites and find what's accurate. You could even go to the BOP website, which is five minutes, and you get a status on any inmate. So to me, if you're going to go out there and you're going to say, if you're going to report on something, it's very important that you try to use credible sources and vet the information before you start talking about it. As we know in this society, think of all the false information that's out there. I I don't have to tell you guys. Go on Facebook. There's so much false information. Then when you try to dig in and trace back to where the source is, you'll find a lot of it's just not credible. It's not a credible source. And that's what's important. Try to go to credible source. Anybody could write anything on the internet. I could start a page today and just start spewing nonsense about all different things that are not factual, that are blatant lies, and just have it out in the web space. And it could show up in search results. And then you could get people who go and cite my nonsensical site as their source. And they'll be pushing that, and then somebody else will run with it, somebody else will run with it. And before you know it, you have all these rumors spreading that are completely baseless and come from thin air and come from no fact at all, no factual backing at all. And that's the reality of it. That's why it's important you have an obligation, in my opinion, when you are on these different formats. If you're trying, now if you're doing an entertainment show and you're just talking nonsense, okay, that's different. You get, you know, that's totally different. Uh, There's a lot of shows out there that are just, not in this genre, I'm talking just in general, where they're just doing entertainment, it has nothing to do with facts. That's obviously not what I'm focusing on here. What I'm focusing on is if you're talking about lives, you're talking about cases, you're talking about stories, you really need to get your facts in order before you start talking about it. And understand what you're reading. I hear a lot of things, they'll be reading something, and then they'll comment, and that's totally not what the document said. So I don't know what they're reading. I mean, they'll actually read it verbatim and then they'll give their own personal opinion and comment and it has, it's completely it's completely opposite of what was stated in the document they're referencing. So it's just important if you're on these platforms, take the time. People are listening to you. People are going to go to you for facts uh, or, or to, not for facts, I guess just go to you to understand what's going on understand the latest story. Just make sure you have your facts in order and things are vetted out properly because that's very, very important. Very important. Uh, And along those lines, I noticed, um, just let me jump back a little bit to the case 
uh, with the Rule 33 uh, that was submitted on behalf of the case that I'm currently working on. I noticed some people, they really don't know what they're talking about when they are weighing the basis of the Rule 33. Commenters make comments such as, oh, well, nothing, nothing anybody says that isn't under oath can't be classified as newly discovered evidence anyway. Okay, that's completely not true. You need to dive in again and understand your facts. Being under oath has nothing to do with it. If you go out and tell different stories that contradict what was disclosed to the government, and remember, when you're disclosing those stories to the government, you're not under oath. You're only under oath when you're testifying. When you give disclosures to the government, that's you giving them the story. It's the same exact thing as when you go out and talk or you want to say something on a podcast. So I don't know where they pulled that from, that it has to be under oath to be admissible. That's completely inaccurate. They have no idea what they're talking about. It has zero to do with being under oath. It has to do with what is being told, what account of the story is being told now, what newly developed information is being disclosed now that wasn't disclosed prior to trial or during trial. That's what the issue is. It has zero to do with under oath. So I wanted to clear that up because I see that quite often and they just don't know what they're talking about. And to me, that tells me those are the type of people, they just don't want things to be true. They want to brush it off because they're so nervous. Perhaps they have a favorite informant and they don't want anything to reflect badly on that informant. So they're doing damage control, but they're talking nonsense. That's not factual. That's not how the system works. You don't have to be under oath for that to have any validity. They're on a public platform. They're telling stories. They're making statements that contradict what was disclosed prior. That's the, that's the issue at hand. I just wanted to highlight that because I've seen that many times, actually. Oh, well, it has to be under oath. I don't know where they pulled that out of. Completely not true, completely not accurate, and completely not part of what needs what is required for a Rule 33 memo of law submission. So, again, that's not true. I wanted to clarify that so people understand. It has nothing to do with being under oath. It has to do with the content, what's said, what's stated, and then it goes from there. The, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and this is for defense team and defendants, it's very important when these, and nowadays anyway, when episodes from these informants are dropped, it's very important you grab them immediately. Don't wait. Grab them, put them in a the database, put them on a hard drive. My firm, pretty much every episode that's dropped on every informant out there, is housed in a database. And I'll tell you why. Things happen where the episodes will be removed. Perhaps perhaps an informant gets a call from their handler and says, you shouldn't have said that. Take it down immediately. Perhaps something happens and all the episodes are gone. Now they're gone. Something that could have helped you, could have helped your client, is now gone. That's why it's very important. My team is very proactive with that. We have systems in place when episodes are dropped, they're immediately grabbed and immediately housed, and if needed, immediately transcribed. So my advice is when you see them, grab them, because many times they're not going to be there. And a lot of it could be if perhaps they have uh, supervised release restrictions, whereas they can't interact with other informants and yet they're doing podcasts with other informants, or felons, I should say, and yet they're doing podcasts with felons. So you just want to have all that. Anything that could help your defendant, perhaps during trial, before trial, preparing for trial, and even after trial, you never know when you're going to need it. So what harm is it? If you're, part of, if you're in that realm, if you're part of that team, there is no harm in grabbing it, buying a little external hard drive, Nowadays, they're not expensive at all. You can get a four terabyte hard drive for $60, I think. And you could house a ton of data on that. And just put it on the hard drive and you could forget about it. Hopefully, you never have to use it. But if you're part of that realm, you're part of the defense, you're part of dealing with clients, with people, you want to grab that immediately. Because when it's gone, it's gone in essence. It would be a big project to get it. You'd have to subpoena YouTube. It's a whole thing. So you're better off just grabbing it, and then you have it. So it doesn't matter. They take it down. They don't take it down. They keep it up. It doesn't matter. You know you have it. You know if your client needs it, it's there, it's available, and you could utilize it. 
So that's definitely my advice. If there's certain informants that relate to a client, to a defendant, to a loved one, every time they drop a comment, every time they drop an episode, every time they drop an Instagram post, grab it. House it and keep it. You never know when it could help you. You'll be surprised at what could help and what could improve a situation, improve the, the level of the defense you could give your defendant. You'll be surprised how comments made, how interactions, how posts could have an impact and could be used properly as part of, the, of a defense strategy. I spoke about how you could do videos during a, an opening, open a, over a closing. You could do a compilation using these different things. If you merely want to show true character, say a person came on the stand and they're an informant and the government did their usual job where they dress them up, they polish them up, they school them, they give them uh, lecture after lecture about how to conduct themselves on the stand and the jury's very impressed with how they're carrying themselves. Now you do a little video presentation in your closing argument after all that and you show their true colors. You show the posts they make. You show the nasty remarks they would make. You show the outbursts they may have with subscribers or with commenters. Just show the jury perhaps a different side of this facade that they put on during their testimony. So all of those things when added up will have a cumulative effect and impact on the trial and on what's being presented to the jury. People don't realize that, and they don't realize the significance of it. And it's important that you do, and I tell all these things to help people. I tell all these things not to, not to defend anybody. I tell these things to even out the playing field so you have a fairer shot at trial. Let's be honest. From day one, there's a disadvantage against all defendants. You're going against a state, you're going against a government who has endless resources, endless contacts, endless money, highly intelligent members of the team that they're using. How do you counteract that? You got to think outside the box. That's the only way to counteract that. You have to do things that's never been done before. You have to use things. And fortunately, with the internet and with a lot of these informants wanting to be famous and wanting to um, sell merchandise and, and want to do talk shows and podcasts, and then, there's a lot of information nowadays that wasn't available 30 years ago, 20 years ago, however long ago, 10 years ago, whatever you want to say. But it just wasn't there is my point. Use it. Don't dismiss it. Use what's there now to help build a fair defense, to give a fair opportunity for the defendant. And as I always say, if they're guilty of the charges, they're guilty of the charges. But you could fight it as best you can. You could put on a proper defense. You don't throw in the towel. You do the best you can. Now, when they're getting out and right lied on and tales are being told that are completely untrue, that's a different story. Now you got to do your best to really come out guns blazing because now you're having an innocent person of those charges. The charges that they're being faced with, they're innocent of those charges. You could make whatever general statements you want. You could say, oh, well, this person may be a bad person. They did this in their past. They have this reputation. That's fine. You could believe that. But you have to go by the charges. When somebody's arrested, they're charged with a certain crime. You have to make sure the evidence fits that crime. And you're not convicting based on reputation, based on media portrayal, based on allegations, you want to make sure that the evidence, the discovery, the facts of the case support this person's level of guilt. So my advice is all geared to trying to even the playing field a little bit. You have to do things that may be unorthodox and you may get some pushback, not in a good way. You may get some pushback from your attorneys because they may not be familiar with that. A lot of the old school attorneys, they're not used to that style. They're not used to certain things and that's fine. But if you have a reasonable attorney, uh, and remember one important thing, people, attorneys work for for the defendant. And I don't know, maybe some attorneys won't be happy with me saying that. And again, I really don't care. But the attorneys don't work for the defendant. Even my firm, we work for the client in essence. What the client wants us to do is what we're gonna do. We'll give our advice, we'll, we'll try to steer them correctly, but we have to do what's in the best interest of the client. So you need to hear what the client has to say. 
If the client wants you to do something, you, you owe it to them to investigate it, to look into it. And if you determine that it, it won't help their case, it'll hurt their case, then explain that. Explain that. Be transparent about it. The client will understand. You just got to be transparent, but you can't dismiss things because you're not used to them or it's a new way of doing things. You know, th there's a lot going against the defendant from day one. So sometimes something that seems radical or out of the box or even a little crazy, it may not be that crazy when you look at it through different optics and you look at it from the perspective of how do we give this client, this defendant, the best defense possible? How could we do that? Weigh everything. Look at the entire picture and see what are the strong points, what are the weak points. And a lot of the tactics I talk about Maybe a little different. Maybe something that wasn't done before. Maybe something that some defense attorneys may not be comfortable with only because they're not familiar with it. But that doesn't mean it's not effective. These things are effective. The juror, everybody on the jury is a member of society, a member of the public. They're not legal professionals. They're not legal analysis. You have to relate to people as people. Relate to their common sense. Relate to to how they interpret things. Bringing in social media, bringing in YouTube, bringing in comments, they will relate to that. Society on a whole is vested in social media. They understand it, they see it. So they will relate to that. So although in the eyes of the law, it may be considered unorthodox or not usual tactic, in the eyes of the jury, they'll relate to it. It won't really be that foreign to them. And I notice sometimes those involved in the legal realm, they have blinders on because they do look at things more systematic and how it's done in the eyes of the law. And I understand that. But you have to remember you're dealing with 12 jurors who are members of the public. So you need to balance between the legal aspect, proceedings, how things are done, and also appeal to your audience. And your audience is 12 members of the public. So whatever you could use to pique the interest of those members of the public is vital. It's vital to giving your defendant a fair trial, as fair as you could get it anyway. In my opinion, it will never be fair because of too many things I'm aware of that takes place, especially when you may have a judge who perhaps is not being that fair and you don't get certain rulings on motions and they allow certain things in, don't allow other things in, then you have a real battle on your hands and Unfortunately, it's very hard to overcome that, even if you're trying to appeal to the jury because the judge sh has so much power in the courtroom. The judge is pretty much God in the courtroom. And the jury, the jury does look at the judge for approval many times. I've noticed in many trials, the jury will be locked in on the judge's expressions and how the judge rules. And I actually did an episode on that Whereas even a judge's facial expression could impact the jury, the juror's observation. They may see the judge wince or roll their eyes, and I'm, I'm just using examples, roll their eyes, uh, some kind of gesture, and the juror may take that information and say, oh, the judge doesn't believe this, the judge isn't buying this, the judge doesn't like this, and that could sway their internal conclusion. Or, their, or what they're seeing. They may actually alter their own opinion based on how the, the judge interacts. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of elements at play for a proper defense trial. And I believe being aware of all those things will help everybody to plan for that and coordinate their efforts to make certain they're giving their client the best defense possible. So I, I try to share things that I believe are effective, things from my experience, things that I know work, things that don't work, and a, as time goes by, come up with almost a hybrid of how to properly give an effective defense. And not being a lawyer, I obviously have to run these things by the attorneys who hire my firm, and for the majority, I must say, we're in sync on a lot of items. We're in sync, and the, 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 the attorneys I've worked with are mostly in sync. There's been battles, 
Uh, don't get me wrong, there's been battles. Uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but it's a conversation, and it's always in the best interest of the defendant. The battles are always in the best interest. So you got to keep all those things in mind when you're dealing with that. And there's a lot that can be done, but you have to think outside of the norm. You have to try to look, and the answers are right in front of you. Uh, a lot of the answers were given to us based on these new occupations that a lot of these informants want to take on where they want to be heavily involved in social media and bragging and um, creating new opportunities, a lot of things are going to fall in your lap. You just have to be keen to it. You have to be honed in on it. And you have to know what could help you, what could hurt you, and use it properly. Uh, more of a, a personal notation for my listeners, if you get a chance, look into Kane Shades Unk podcast. He has a podcast, and honestly, I like his podcast because it's really not its not entrenched in that whole genre. He talks about sports. It's, an, it's entertaining. I like a show. I, I like the gentleman who does the podcast. He seems like a sincere individual. And why I really like him is his position on informants. Him and I share similar beliefs on that. And also, he's a Bills fan, so... He gets a point for that because I'm also a Bills fan. But if you get a chance, check him out. And as always, give uh, Mob Rats Exposed a uh, subscription. The guy's doing good things. It's entertaining. He cracks me up. When I can't sleep at night or I'm working late at night, I'll put him on and I'm finding myself laughing. So definitely, definitely check those guys out. Again, it's all part of just trying to enlighten the public. People are going to try to say, and they, they'll never let go of it, they're going to say, oh, you guys are glorifying the mob. And, all. and again, I can't say it enough, that statement is moronic. It has zero to do with glorification. It has to do with what's right. If somebody's guilty, they're guilty, fine. But when they're not getting a fair trial, when they're being lied upon, when well, these informants are blatantly lying and making up tales, that's a big problem. It just has to do with the justice system. It has nothing to do with the person. It's the justice system. If you believe everybody's entitled to a fair trial, then you have to get rid of that stupid comment about glorification because that's not what it's about. It's about people getting a fair, fair trial. If they're guilty, they're guilty. That's how life works. You put on your best defense, you give it your best shot, but if you're guilty and the evidence has you dead to rights, that's, the, that's how the system works. The system's in place for that. But when charges are being manufactured, informants are lying to fit the narrative informants are lying to get a big target, that's a problem. And I use the pushback just to signif signify it's about pushing back on the, tr on the lies being spread. It's not pushing back about, oh, we hate rats and this and that. I always tell you, that's personal opinion. That's irrelevant to me. I have my beliefs. My listeners have their beliefs. That's totally different. That's where you go. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where you have friendships. When you build true friendships, that's more related to that. Those are people who have share the same philosophies on things like that on an intimate level. That's where relationships could be born. As far as the average listener and supporter, it should be just about getting the facts, getting the truth. There's no glorification. It's about, in my channel especially, Mine is about making sure people are aware of what goes on in the system, and I do my small, tiny little part to educate those who may simply not be aware, and they want to be aware of things, and they want to know how things work, because for so many years, they're under this illusion that the justice system's perfect, everybody gets a fair trial, so I try to just enlighten them that that's not the case, and I use specific events, cases, personal experience to support my claims. Whether they believe me or not, or agree with me a lot, is uh, agree with me or not, is irrelevant. I always say it's irrelevant. I'm not here to convince anybody. My show is closing in on two years. November will be two years. Go play all my shows from the first episode. I never once came on here and said I want to try to convince. Her. It's never been about convincing people to think like me. Never once did I ever say like that. I always just try to lay out my side lay out what I feel is important, lay out what's relevant, and it's up to you as the listeners to decide where you align. That's all it's about, and that's all I'll continue to be about. And trust me, I could come on here and, and give my opinion and bash and, and rip 
rip certain people up because I do have strong personal feelings on that. But that's not what I do. That's To me, that's not productive and that's not professional for what I'm doing here. It's not professional. It's not the, the format for that. People don't need to hear me on here bashing this one. That's not what it's about. What I try to do is expose things, push back, say, okay, they've been saying this for five years, seven years. Have Well, guess what? Here's some facts. Here's some backing. Here's what really happened. And it will all go into play. And I, I, I try to support what I claim with certain things. I, I spoke about the um, dash cam footage I'm going to be putting up, which totally contradicts Pasqua, that Frank Pasqua III's claims that he wasn't a rat in Mississippi. Mississippi totally, totally blows that out of the water. You'll see it for your own eyes. Again, has to do with facts. To, the the um, YouTube realm and the podcast realm is allowing too many people to go on, recreate their life, recreate history, recreate uh, fantasy things that never even took place. Just make up shit. And sorry for cursing. I don't really like to curse too much on the show, but <laughs> make up stuff, and then and then and then make it as if it's gospel. And that I have a problem with. If I if I'm that's one thing I'm definitely going to focus on, especially moving forward. When I'm aware of things that are co- completely be disproven and dismantled, I'm going to get involved and I'm going to do that. I'm going to show how it's nonsense. So I don't want them comfortable with coming out here and just telling the public lies because it ins- it's insulting to the public. It's insulting to the viewers. You want to come on. You want to tell your story. Be truthful about it. You want to uh, act like who you supposedly were. Be truthful about it. Stop fabricating, stop exaggerating to make yourself look like this big tough guy and stop doing that. Because if you're not and you're lying and it could be proven, trust me, I'm going to jump all over that. And they don't even have to be related to my, to anything I'm involved with. I don't like that. I don't like the public uh, being fooled like that. And I don't, it, it actually annoys me. It annoys me when somebody comes out, makes themselves something they're not, lies about people about good people that wouldn't even cross the street with some of these individuals, wouldn't even cross the street. And they'll come out here and lie as if they're friends with people, they knew people. So when I'm aware of that, I'm definitely, and that's part of my pushback. I'm definitely exposing as much as I can where it relates to that and where it impacts maybe people I care about, people I know about. And that's the small part I'm going to continue to do. And I have a lot of ideas and a lot of things for down the road that I think I could really improve upon the message I'm giving. And there's a few things I'm working on that will all go to that one big one big uh, concept that I'm trying to portray here. I posted a few things on my community tab about some guests I am working on getting on, and that looks like that may happen. So I'm grateful for that. And it's going to really expose a lot of these the BS that's been told for a long time now. And that's all it's about. They want to come out unchecked and not have anybody say anything. That's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. At least while I'm doing this, that's not going to happen. I'm hoping other people do the same thing because that's just simply not going to happen. You're not going to go unchecked. You want to come out and play celebrity. Well, I'm going to come out and show you that you're full of you-know-what. And that's all I have to say about that. Once again, sincere thank you to all who support the channel, everyone who shared the book, Guilt for the Guiltless. If you want to download it, guiltforthegiltless.com. You could get the ebook, the audio book, both free. It's not about the money. It's about just enlightening the public, let them know what goes on. Thank you to everybody who shared it. Uh, there's another channel actually I wanted to mention, Wise Guy TV, I believe is the name of the channel. He said he's going to be doing a review on the book, uh, an unbiased review, which is all I want. Just read it. Let the facts dictate where your position falls. That's all. Read it and let the facts dictate. And there's been a lot of channels, I noticed, who are sharing the book. That's all great stuff. And of course, huge thank you to the investigative journalist, the author, Lisa Babick. She did a phenomenal job, monumental job. People don't realize what it took to compile that. Thousands, thousands of pages of court transcripts, motions, I get a headache just thinking about it, and I was the one doing all the discovery on the case, and I get a headache. So huge thank you again. And I did a whole episode uh, 
about it when the book first came out, but it, it needs to be said again because it, it is now gaining traction. A lot of people are tweeting about it and mentioning it. And thank you, everybody, who is taking interest. It's not about being on my side, not about being on the defendant's side. Just taking interest and reading it. Reading it from an open-minded position, third party looking in, just read it. Give it the attention it deserves. And that's it for today. I uh, hope everybody enjoys this day. It's beautiful in New York. So that's it for today. Till next time. You've been listening to the Justice Tech Pros podcast with Dominic Crea, one of the most unique podcasts on the internet, discussing the obstacles the defense team faces when trying a case, what goes on behind the scenes during pretrial and motion phase, holding defense attorneys accountable, making sure they're fighting for their clients, the difference between textbook law and how things truly play out in a courtroom, and everything in between. And everything in between. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show and we'll be back soon until then find us on twitter facebook and instagram at justice tech pros to email the show with questions and comments it's podcast at justice tech pros.com till next time this is justice tech pros podcast and dominic crea signing off